I'm enormously excited <laughs> by this opportunity. I've long wanted to um, have a formal conversation with you, right. mainly because of your impact on my life, but also mm -hmm. that you've impacted so many um, writers, um, both here in Philadelphia and, and beyond. I'm going to send you all bills, right? That's right. <laughs> I, send I, the invoice. I, I told you the <laughs> night that I was someplace and about 10 of my former students were there. When you teach 40 years, you know what that's about. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I was thinking that perhaps I should send you all um, uh, an SRF um, form. And they said, what is that Sanchez retirement uh, <laughs> a fund, right, you know, a dollar a week. <laughs> After teaching 40 years, a dollar a week. Well, some of us owe you more than you know, <laughs> no, But a dollar a week, I that mean, could be a lot. That's right. Right. <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Well, mm. we, I think those of us who fell under your sway very much had to do with your relationship to your practice as a, as a poet but mm -hmm. also someone who never drew the line between one's uh, practice, artist, um, and one's um, life, whether that was as a mother or as an activist. And I'm, I'm curious how you evolved, how you understand your evolution as a poet, but also as someone who is a vital member of their community, and that community is Philadelphia and, and the world. Mm. Well, you know, I uh, started to write poetry as a little girl, um, and it happened, my mom died when I was uh, about one and a half or two. It, 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 there's always, you know, people mm -hmm. say no was one, no was mm -hmm. two, but um, giving birth to twins. Mm -hmm. and, and some years later, I gave birth to twins. It was supposed to, to, to you know, pass me by, you know, mm -hmm. like it's supposed to skip you, mm -hmm. right? Every other. But... And so what I did um, is that my grandmother came and picked me and my sister up, um, uh, and she took her t us to her house. And w wonderful woman, a beautiful woman, she um, allowed me just to be. I, I had a sister, you see, my dear brother, who was beautiful. That is the worst thing you could have on the planet <laughs> Earth is a beautiful sister. <laughs> I mean, she walked into a room. I'm serious. Mm. And people just stopped. You know, mm. the men said, okay, Miss, Miss Pat, mm. uh, Miss Patricia, you know, Miss Anita, you know, here's a chair. I walked in. They said, hi, Miss <laughs> Sanchez. How are you doing? Or I saw you on television. But it was none of that, you mm. know, at mm. all. So as a little girl... Uh, my sister got dressed to go outside, and she came back in the same way she went out. Mm. No dirt, no nothing, just mm. spotless, whatever. I came back with, you know, braids undone, <laughs> dresses torn, <laughs> you know, socks down, scraped leg, whatever. And my grandmother was the person who uh, saved me mm. uh, from the the, um, the cousins who lived in the house. We called them aunties because they were older, uh, who kept... Cluck, you know, they would cluck their tongues and said, this girl just ain't going to grow up to be a lady, which was really very good. Um, and as a consequence of that, she really did protect me. But I also um, started to teach myself how to read. And mm. finally, Mama said, you know, teach uh, Sonia how to read. She's always mm. bothering me about reading. But with, it, with, with reading came also writing. They gave me little mm. pads, you know, because mm. I wanted to write down words. And I started to do these little ditties, dun 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 whatever. And of course mama would say, Oh, this girl writes poetry, she writes poems, whatever. And um everyone went, uh huh. Um, but that's what I did. And of course when my grandmother died, that was uh uh I think we were about I was about six or and my sister was about nine, and that was real trauma there in a place called Birmingham, Alabama. Um but I continued to write, and every day in my reputation, as we went to these various uh, families to live, they would say, oh, Patricia, oh, and they would all, mm -hmm. you know, say, mm -hmm. Patricia, whatever, right? And then they would say, Sonia's a quiet one, you know, too quiet, you know, give her a book, and she'll, she'll be okay. <laughs> and that was true. And, you know, I, in, in that book of Haku that I read from, I had written a poem to my sister about... Um, being beautiful. Mm. And I said, it, unless you have protection in the family, being beautiful is dangerous mm -hmm. for a little girl mm -hmm. or even for a little boy because people want to touch you all the time, mm -hmm. you know. And so 
I, I wrote that poem, but I never published it until mm. after she died. Mm. So that whole process of writing very young, and I was a reader, you know, you gave me a book. What saved me with the various places we went is that, you know, I was a stutterer. Mm -hmm. I began a, a distinct stutter uh, after Mama died. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to a house and they said, oh, quiet one. She goes, uh, 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 everyone laughed. But it also meant they didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. I could go off in the corner someplace and just sit and read. So you were able to develop this interior life. Oh, it was a real real interior life, you know. <laughs> and I was a daydreamer. Yeah. I maintain that to be a really good poet, you have got to daydream. Mm. You've got mm. to, you know, you've got to see yourself. I saw myself always on stage. Mm. Now, that's interesting as a stutterer, mm -hmm. right? But I saw myself on stage doing poetry, whatever, mm -hmm. which I would never, as mm -hmm. a very shy person, you know, have done. And the first time I got on stage, uh, uh, fast forwarding, uh, came from a man by the name of Larry Neal, mm -hmm. you know, and Nero Jones, or Amidi Baraka, uh, living in a place called New York City, uh, beginning the black arts movement. Uh, they had invited me to read, and I said, reluctantly, mm -hmm. okay, because you see, I always heard my stutters, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. At some point, the stutters had, had dissipated. But I still heard the stutters. To this day, I hear stutters, mm. you know. But the point is that I know I have control over the stutters. I say, you know, get back, you know, you know. <laughs> but um, I love this story that I heard mm -hmm. about your jumping out of a window <laughs> as a kid. Oh, that was a mama. That was a mama. You know, outside, I ran with the boys. My sister was with the girls, and they were always in these dainty little dresses, you know, the little pinafore dresses, you know, little shoes, and they were like outside, you know, looking around, whatever. I don't know what they did. I guess they jumped rope or they played jacks. But I ran outside, and the boys said, let's go, and we ran, we climbed trees, we jumped over, we came down big hills on, bi on these tricycles, mm -hmm. you know, really danger, dangerous kinds of stuff, whatever. Um, but we were outside, and someone said, I'm the leader. And so they started to fight these guys. And I said, you know, I know, let's do something special. And the one who does it will be the leader, okay? So we ran into the house, went up to the second floor, and I'm standing there. Well, right by the bed was this window, right? And I said, I know. The person who jumps out the window and gets up will be the leader. <laughs> well, these guys looked at me like I was insane. But what I had done is that, Right by my, my that window was a tree, mm -hmm. and I figured if I jump, I'll hit the tree, slide down the tree, and I'll be okay. <laughs> so I got up in the window, and as I got up in the window, they went running for Mama and the rest of the family, and I jumped, but I jumped too hard, and I hit it hard, huh. and I came down with a plop, you know, and bruised my knees, right? And Mama comes out of the kitchen, um, and of course my aunts come out, you know, clucking that tongue. <laughs> Look at her. And Mama says, are you okay, Sonia? And she said, I'm going to have to wipe these knees. And she said, Louise, go get some, some mercurochrome, or what I think they mm -hmm. used then. They washed my knees off, put it on. And I turned around and said to these guys, okay, I'm the leader. <laughs> right? and, and I led them on the expedition at that point. But the next day I came out to play, my dear brother. This is mm. what, what's so wonderful about children. No one said, you're still the leader. We just came out and played. <laughs> they, right. But for that moment, from, from that jump, I was a leader. And that's so true. That I love amazing. it as an allegory to talk about upending patriarchy by jumping out of a window. That's <laughs> what you have to do. Window, you know? <laughs> they went to get Mama to tell her that I was jumping out a window. But Mama, the thing that was so amazing about being in a house of women... Hmm is that Mama uh, wasn't upset. Mm -hmm. The aunts were upset. Mama said, Yo, you okay, girl? Mm -hmm. You know, get some uh, uh, soap and water, get some mercurochrome. I remember always mercurochrome on my knees, right? Mm -hmm. My legs, right? And then she said, you want to go play? You know, I went, I said, I'm the leader. <laughs> Boom, we were gone. Um, that was an amazing moment, you know, in, in my history yes. at that particular point. I, right? I, 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 I so enjoy reading that story. Right. I also am thinking about um, when you arrive to New York after Mama Dixon dies and you mm -hmm. go to live in New York mm -hmm. with your father. Mm -hmm. um, you go to Hunter College mm -hmm. and for free. For free. Yeah, hundred dollars a semester. Can oh. you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, 
city the city colleges were free mm -hmm. in those days, mm -hmm. you know, and it was free for those students who had a certain grade average coming out mm -hmm. of high school. Um, so city college, I I I was was accepted in city college and in Hunter College. City College, you had to buy books, mm -hmm. but we could not afford books, right? And City College was like a walk mm -hmm. from my house where we lived. Hunter College was on 68th Street and Park Avenue, my mm -hmm. dear brother. You had to take a bus all mm -hmm. the way downtown. Mm -hmm. But the books were free, mm -hmm. you know, so I went to a place called Hunter College. Mm -hmm. I, I think about Hunter in relation to um, Schomburg in relation to mm -hmm. the bookstore up in Harlem mm -hmm. where you, what we don't realize sometimes, mm -hmm. and I, I mm -hmm. count you among uh, my spirited um, ancestors, who li living ancestors who cultivate voices. There's mm -hmm. a moment in one of your poems, the July 4th, 1994 poem, right. to uh, President Vaclav uh, mm -hmm. Havel where you say, come out. Right. You know, these were individuals that ushered your voice, and I'm wondering about right. those individuals who was, you would attribute to. This president, you know, gets the, the medal that they give mm -hmm. here. I don't the know presidential what, medal. Medal mm -hmm. here in Philadelphia. And uh, Rendell was mayor. Mm -hmm. And Rendell, uh, or people around him, asked me would I do a poem for mm -hmm. him. And it, I, I worked on that poem for weeks, whatever, mm -hmm. because you know, he's the president of a... Uh, and when I finished reading the poem, an interesting thing happened. One of the, um, uh, I won't mention who it was, one of the clergy mm -hmm. sitting next to me was so, just talked to me the whole time. <laughs> when I finished that poem, he turned, <laughs> he turned away, because I mentioned gays. That's right, yeah. And there, you mm -hmm. see. But he turned away, literally turned away from me. But... The brother got up, the president got up and said, I don't have to say anything now. Mm -hmm. Professor Sanchez has mm -hmm. said everything, you know. Mm -hmm. It was such a wonderful, mm -hmm. and I sent my poem to him. Uh, you no, know, I got the address, his, I don't know if that was his wife, but the person he was traveling with mm -hmm. um, got the address. I sent, you know, the poem mm -hmm. and got a thank you note, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, from mm -hmm. him also, too, because it was important, you know, how i written the poem, but it was not, like, legible. It was <laughs> <laughs> up there, you know how we do, you know. It's like when... Um, so you had to get it typed up. I mean, right, you know, so <laughs> I, had, I had, like, a little arrow going here, a little arrow going there. It's like when Ozzy died, you know, and I came off the, um, you know, up and... And Ruby was still alive at the time, Ruby D, and she said... I went over and hugged the family. She mm. said, give me the poem. And I, I said, Ruby... <laughs> She said, oh, yes, you have to rewrite it, right? <laughs> I had arrows going up and down, whatever. And, you know, so I guess if I looked somewhat flushed, right, mm -hmm. it's because I wasn't sure I was following the arrow in the right way. <laughs> you know how you do things at the last That's minute right. sometimes, right? It, the line goes, come, we salute you and say, come, come, move out into this world, nourish your lives with a spirituality that allows us to respect each other's birth. Mm -hmm. And I think about mentorship mm -hmm. and I think about that component of it. Of course, we're writing poems and we are mm -hmm. saying what needs to be said, but mm -hmm. there's also this other component of the writing that is about respect and acknowledging each mm -hmm. other's existence on this earth. Right. Yeah. You know, I we just celebrated, well, you were there when we celebrated the, the centennial of Sister Gwendolyn Brooks, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, Gwen and I had a long talk once when I was in uh, Chicago. And, and I said to her, you know, I studied with Louise Bogan, which means simply that we wrote, I wrote like Louise Bogan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you study with someone, you tend to do that, right? And I said it was interesting at some point how I had to find my voice. And it's not that, that your work becomes less complex, but you learn how to deal with complexities. Mm. I mean, the beginning of mm -hmm. that 4th of July mm -hmm. is, if you know, it is, you know, complex, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever. And then at some point you've got to say to the people, because I remember reading it there and people standing up, because mm -hmm. by the time I got to that section where I said, now sing it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, now really sing it, because after you said this and that for four or five stanzas, now bring them to 
uh, one of the messages that they must hear, and that is we've got to at some point begin to acknowledge uh, who we are on this mm -hmm. earth and, and to move as human beings with each other. And unless we do that, we might as well just pull the shade, get out <laughs> the reefer, you mm -hmm. know, bring, mm -hmm. the, bring the vino, the mm -hmm. wine, right? and forget about it because it is, these are very dangerous times mm -hmm. right now. And I mean just for the earth, not only for the people, mm -hmm. but for the earth because we have people, you know, who don't believe that, that this earth is being warmed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's global warming here. I watch icebergs just sink you know, and I said to someone who said, well, you know, that just happened because it's been so warm. And I wanted to still say, like my grandmother used to say, come over here, girl. Let me shake some sense into you, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what we've been saying. It's, and what do you think happens when the water keeps rising? Mm -hmm. So when I was in a place called, um, when I first went to San Francisco to help begin black studies, right? Uh, one of the Native Americans was there, a chieftain, mm -hmm. and he gave this to me because I gave a talk mm -hmm. and then I ended up uh, with a poem with chants and he said, you just chanted what we chant, Professor Sanchez. And I said, I know all those chants that I do are so similar they, that mm -hmm. you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, but he said to me, are you going to stay in California? I said, I recognize the fact that I'm an Easterner. I mean, I, I mean, I really don't like, I like to visit California, right. but not live in California. I said, I'm going back home to the East Coast. I know in a couple of years. He said, good, because California is going into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at him, and I said, well, yeah, right, but not anytime soon, I hope. But then he said, he gave me a map that the native, that, um, uh, that first, the first people have, mm -hmm. you know, um, and in it was, there was no California, right? There was no Florida, because Florida also was underwater. And then this map had, there was no, where I come from, New York City. And I, I the nerve and the arrogance of New Yorkers, myself included, I said, oh no, that has got to be wrong. <laughs> I said, because, you know, New York doesn't go under, right? You know, that's New York City. You see those buildings like that? And he looked at me, he said, it's an island. Mm, and I said, you're right. That's right. So you have to go up, you that's know, right. up in the hills but away. But what I'm saying at some point is that the, the joy of writing um, um, and also knowing, in quotes, how to write, in quotes, complex stuff that people expect of you. But at the same time, what Sister Grinlin said to me, who wrote very complex poetry mm -hmm. uh, also, too, she said, Sonia, what I like about your poetry is that you mix it. Mm. And I have to learn how to mix it. You know, you know, you you know, at some point you you bring people in, you know, to that arena if that's what they like. Mm -hmm. And then you also say, but stay and listen, mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. also perhaps what I'm gonna sing to you mm. at some point, because they really do belong together, mm -hmm. you know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of motion and movement together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I did Does Your House Have Lines but my my father's um um, that came from Sister Gwen because I was teaching. Um, Mar Martha. No, no, I was teaching uh, the, the uh, is it Ron Royal? The Ron Royal. So, yeah. So, yeah. So the the piece that she did um, with Ron Royal. Uh, right. Uh, was that Annie Allen? Annie Allen. Right. Yeah. yeah. The Annie. Yeah. Uh, the Annie. Yes. Right. And. Um, it was in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't teach stuff without it being in your head. Well, the students were complaining that it was difficult. Mm -hmm. And so I said, anything that's difficult, you need to read out loud. <laughs> you know, chain the mm -hmm. ear. So I had been reading it out loud with them. And I, and I woke up in the middle of the night. And, you know, you sleep with dictionaries, you know, <laughs> books, books, you know, <laughs> notebooks, you know, whatever. And I turned on the light and I picked up this pad and I started to write. This was a migration unlike the 1900s. I mean, I literally you wrote had that, that out. You had that meter in your ear. I, you had that like, rhythm. It, I couldn't yeah. get rid of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I put it down, went back to mm -hmm. sleep. When I woke up about 7, and, you know, you always, that's when you read it and you say, well, does this really make any mm -hmm. sense? You know, do mm -hmm. I just do this, you know, or cross it out? And I said, oh, good. Oh, I'll do about three stanzas mm -hmm. about this. And that book went on forever and ever and ever. Right? It's compelling how mm -hmm. entering, what, you're, what you describe is something that happens to me, which is you enter into a ship or That's you right. enter into the river itself. Mm -hmm. And it's something about it that kind of pulls you, pulls you through. You're there. The, yeah. um, 
Mm -hmm. I was, as you were talking, I was also thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks's praise of your work strikes me as quite ag accurate because there's a way in which the, when we write, when we use this material called language, to some extent, you and I both know this, it writes us, we're talking about it pulling us, mm -hmm. but we also put our thumbprint on the language so that right. when I hear you mm -hmm. read your work, even without your name mm -hmm. on the paper where mm -hmm. I come across in the book, I know that's a, mm -hmm. a Sanchez poem mm -hmm. and, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm curious about how that evolution for you, how you, that moment where you say, you know, I write, I studied with Louise Bogan, mm -hmm. and then it, it starts to change Right. You start to, as right. you say, find, find you your find voice. Your voice. Yeah. So, you find your voice. I think like anyone, um, I am so f grateful for Bogan because what happened to me as a young woman who was a, a quiet writer, mm -hmm. you know, a secret writer, uh, uh, my family knew every now and then I'd leave something around and my sister would go in the kitchen and go, dun, dun, dun. You know, she'd mm -hmm. read what I wrote and, you know, everyone would laugh, but that was it. And I hit on my work. I, my, my work, my job on Saturdays was to clean the bathroom. Mm. You know, we had those old-fashioned tubs that now people pay, what, $300 mm -hmm. for? Well, you know, we hated them, right? But I could hide my books underneath mm. the tub because I cleaned, mm -hmm. the, and no one went under the tub mm -hmm. but me. And as a consequence, you know, there I was with, you know, my books, you know, in there, writing, you know, in there, in the bathroom at night at 3 and 4 o'clock in mm -hmm. the morning. And so Bogan taught us form. Mm -hmm. That's why I always taught form. Um, because she was right. The form made us get that control of mm -hmm. the words. You walk into a place and there's always, you know, you just throw everything mm -hmm. out that you're mm -hmm. thinking and she made us bring it under control. Mm -hmm. But I had tried to, to uh, as a young woman, when I got out of Hunter, I had tried to, and I went to grad, I was registered for grad school, didn't have much money so I was taking no more than 12 credits, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I went, I saw a workshop, and I won't mention names mm -hmm. on this, okay? But the workshops were being held at various places around New York. I walked into the classroom, all men, mm -hmm. you know, and I was the only woman mm -hmm. and the only black. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down, and I'm happy because I'm in a workshop, whatever. And I would raise my hand, and I'd make a comment, and it was complete silence. Mm -hmm. I'm really serious mm -hmm. about this. And so I said, well, okay, maybe they all agree, <laughs> <laughs> except by the third week, you know, that continued. And I just, I stopped going. Mm -hmm. And I did about three workshops like that until I literally gave up. When I uh, registered the following semester, I saw in the bulletin uh, poetry, Louise Bogan, and, you know, she was the poetry editor for the New Yorker, New Yorker right? Yeah. And I said, go, don't register. Go sit by the door yeah. and see what happens. Well, I walked into a class of 45 people. There were two women, you know, and Joanne, Joanna is a children's uh, mm. uh, uh, writer now because mm -hmm. I saw her some years later. And myself, mm. all men looking. Mm. And so I sat by the door saying, quick exit on this. <laughs> Except Bogan came said, well, I want you to know, you know, <laughs> that I teach form. <laughs> and so those of you who don't like form, I guess you can leave. Now, no one left at all, but we did have a quiet moan, like, what are we doing in here, mm -hmm. you know, with form? Mm -hmm. And then she said, does anyone have a poem? But that's like asking my dear brother, an alcoholic, <laughs> you know, if there's a bottle hidden someplace in the house, because mm -hmm. you know there is one. Mm -hmm. We reached in pockets, purses, briefcases, whatever. And I raised my hand immediately, and she called on me first. Mm -hmm. I went up front, and I said, find out now. I read the piece, right, which I said, this is not finished, right, mm -hmm. but this is all I have, you know, mm -hmm. with me. And I read it, and hands went up to begin to respond to it. And above all, she responded. Mm -hmm. And I, I sat down and went, okay. I would reg went and registered for the class. Um, uh, it was in that class, she taught us how to do a notebook and how to uh, when you send out poems, mm -hmm. don't send any more than three, because if you don't get the person by the third poem, they're not going to go to right. the fourth yeah. or fifth mm -hmm. or sixth, right? And we did that, right? And um, 
uh, I started sending poems out. I went and dropped my po my about my poetry in the mailbox. By the time I got home that afternoon, it had returned to the returned. editors, <laughs> right? But I didn't get annoyed. People got annoyed in the class. I said it made me go, okay, okay, I'll try whatever. I'll try again, and you know, and what I did is, I, so I got a letter. Um, I got a um, uh, a response from George Garrett oh, at the Paris Review yeah. who said, this poem would have been in, I knew I was getting close. This is one semester mm. I'm in, right? But he said, we had we had promised some people we knew that we mm. would publish, but you keep, I still have that letter from him. It was not the editors. It was this nice note from him. Um, and I said, okay, keep rearranging whatever. Well, lo and behold, I come home uh, from work and 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 from one of the classes, and there in the mail was. So I went and got mm. bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and I had. They, they weren't even shopping. Was bags this your in those first days. publication? My first publication, mm. my dear brother. Yes. Was, I was in, still in college. I'm mm -hmm. still in, in grad school, right? Um, at NYU. At NYU. At NYU. And yeah. so I, you know, got the bottles because the stores didn't have the shopping bags. It was like the bags, <laughs> right? I came in with bags of wine. <laughs> put it on her desk, and I showed her, and she looked at it, and she smiled. Uh -huh. And we had cups, and we drank, and she said, you know, uh, you know. You know she announced so, it to the class. Yeah, I had got, <laughs> and it was such a joy. And and everyone in the class looked at me, whatever. It was after we finished with her class, it was then that I went to ask her, you know, look, tell me. Uh, she didn't have regular hours like we have mm -hmm. as professors, you know. She was a poet who taught poetry, mm -hmm. which was quite different, right? And I finally got an appointment with her. And the appointment, I want, I said, ask her, I just want to know. She said, yes, how can I help you? And I said, do I have any talent? Mm. She said, well, I never forget, I can still hear, why do you want to know? Well, I thought, <laughs> why does she think I want to know? I'm trying to figure this sucker out, right? right? She said, because lots of people have talent, but they don't do anything with. Mm. And then she told me this amazing story about a friend of hers who was a good poet, she would have dinner with her once a year. The friend brought this most exquisite poem, mm. and she would praise it, but that was it. That was it. She was mm. not disciplined. She said to me, Bogan said, she didn't write every day, or she didn't write monthly, or she mm. didn't write, but she wrote one poem for me to praise. I praised it, but mm. she was not a poet. What a lesson. You know, it, it was an amazing lesson, lesson, my dear Jeez. brother. It was an amazing lesson. Jeez. But it was there that I heard what she said, mm -hmm. and once she said, you know, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I got it. So that whole, there were 10 of us from that class that met on Charles Street in the village. Mm. And we met every Wednesday. And the thing about workshops, my dear brother, is that after the first year, I published two others. Nobody in that workshop published. Mm. And at some point, you have to understand the climate. That begins to, you know, right, you know, it, right. it begins like, like they were good. They were good journals, if you mm -hmm. know what I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. And it began, and we would go afterwards. I like to tell the story to, um, I think it was the five spot mm. uh, in the village. Mm -hmm. And we walked in one day, and there was Baraka, mm -hmm. Leroy Jones. That was your first time back. seeing Baraka. No, I had seen him before. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the first time that we all knew who he was, mm -hmm. so we we said. Um, he said, that's Levo Jones there. I said, yes. We were walking in, and this and this voice says, Sanchez! <laughs> you know, and my stutters <laughs> came back, and I went, yes. He said, send me some poems. I'm editing um, this book out of Paris, France, right? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> and we went to the table to listen to jazz. He said, whoa, do you know who he is? I said, yes, I do know who he is, right? You're gonna see, I said, he doesn't know me from beans. I mean, I had just published in some journals, right? That he read. But he read, he read because them. they mm -hmm. were like journals that you would have mm -hmm. on your on your bookshelf, mm -hmm. right? So I went on about my business. About three weeks later, we come back in, and there he is. He was writing reviews for Downbeat. Mm -hmm. When they finally opened it up, you know, to blacks to write about that jazz music, he was the one who was chosen. And I kept. I went right by him, and the voice says, "Sanchez, so you don't want to be in 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 the book." And I turned and said, "Honest, I said, you were serious." He said, "What do you think?" You know, I said goodbye to everybody. <laughs> I, I got in my Volkswagen man. I went up 
that West Side Highway, you know, uh, I went across town, went up the West Side Highway. I must have done it in five minutes. <laughs> went in, pulled down my Olivetti, right? Got my little <laughs> things, whatever. I went through the poems, whatever. Typed it up, whatever. And I'm a terrible typist, right? <laughs> Went back outside. <laughs> it's nighttime, man. Took it all the way downtown to make sure he got it. About two weeks later, the, a letter came from him, and it, all it said is, Dear Sonia Sanchez, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which meant he accepted it. Yeah, right. So that was my first international one, mm. you know, there. And I guess what I'm saying... But then on, any time he did plays and whatever, he invited me. Yeah, and yeah. it was in that context that you began to travel, you know. And then when he came uptown after Malcolm's assassination, mm -hmm. uh, he sent letters to all of the artists mm -hmm. uh, that said, come help us continue Malcolm's work, mm -hmm. you know, which is an amazing mm -hmm. letter to That's have, right. you know. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to stick with this theme of mentorship and, mm -hmm. and writing communities because mm -hmm. we, you, we can talk about so much here but mm -hmm. I was thinking about several things one your your being in San Francisco mm -hmm. in the late 60s mm -hmm. and the that that environment mid 60s, mid -60s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that environment um, you know we documented we know the importance of that moment mm -hmm. um, you were there creating black studies mm -hmm. but I'm curious about your writing life at that time and if you had a similar sort of right. community because there was also a lot happening in San Francisco right uh, in Berkeley right um, well you know what happened is that we brought Baraka out to do the to do the culture mm -hmm. part and the culture part meant that we got a thing similar to to the house that we had in Harlem, mm -hmm. right? For for um, you know, in order to do uh, the black arts, mm -hmm. so we got a similar thing. And you know who own, who lived in the house was um, uh, what is his name? Um, uh, the, the head of the Panthers at the time. Oh, not Huey, but Cleaver. Uh, Cleaver. Cleaver yeah. came out of prison. Ramparts magazine put him up there. I <laughs> honestly. Have you ever gone and seen someone and you looked at the man and went, whoa, I won't be in this house with him, you know, uh, uh, actually by myself, right? Um, but that's how we, st and we continued that. What we had done in a place called uh, New York City, uh, in that brownstone, it was black arts West. out there, mm -hmm. and, and, and in a sense, West. And Ed Bullens, mm -hmm. Marvin X, Sarah Fabio, there's a brother who just died, a younger brother who just died, and... And there were the brothers who were actors. And Danny Glover came into that mist. You know, I taught Danny, you know, so into that mist. And there we were all. And people lined up around the corner to get in, you know, to come in to hear the poetry and also to see the one-act plays uh, that, that were done. So there was that community, right? But I'd like to tell a story that when we first went out, when we brought Baraka out, the first thing they did was to have a reading. So the two of us coming from uh, my, my, the, the, the north, no, you know, the east, rather. I I from New York, he from Newark, right? So we're up there reading together. No, we're the baddest thing on the planet Earth because we're from the east. And that's that <laughs> arrogance of being from the east, right, you know? So he read, and I responded. And he laughed. And I read back and forth, like, you know, boom, boom, boom. And people clapped. You know, mm -hmm. and someone said, um, said well, um, um, Mr. Jones, um, um, uh, Ms. Sanchez, uh, 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 you know, you all read very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't quite understand all that you said. Could you do it again? <laughs> and we looked at each other, and it was so funny because I did realize that, that once we were out there, every time I said something, people would say, uh, would you say that again? Mm -hmm. But you know what rap has done for the world? Trained our ear to that's hear right, it. That's right, that's right. Trained our ear to hear it. If I go to the yeah. Midwest or California, <laughs> it doesn't matter how. I don't slow down, you know, whatever. Because rap has taught them how to listen, mm -hmm. you know, to what we were saying. And they did. We, we slowed down, but eventually they became accustomed to how we, mm. how we were reading. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and people actually began to read like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that happens when you teach. I know. You know? I remember at Temple, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you had a lot of little Sanchez, Sonia Sanchez is <laughs> reading, yeah. reading in your read style. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. the I'm thinking about um, also we were we were before mm -hmm. filming mm -hmm. thinking about uh, your syllabus, what you had mm -hmm. on the syllabus. Mm -hmm. I was going from San Francisco to Philadelphia mm -hmm. and we were 
I was trying to recall mm-hmm. some of the books that oh, were gosh. on that yes. syllabus, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Harriet right. Jacobs, uh, Toni Morrison's The Bluest, the Bluest the Eye. You know, no one was teaching those people, by mm-hmm. the way. To this mm-hmm. day, people say, oh, I taught Toni Morrison. I say, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we taught Toni Morrison because, mm-hmm. you know, we got the books, read them, and we put it right into the syllabus. Mm-hmm. Um, Tony K. Bambara, mm-hmm. you know, Alice Walker. Some guy on Tempest Campus walked across and said, I'm teaching Alice Walker in this course on pathology. <laughs> I said, she's a novelist. She's a great novelist. You know, <laughs> pathology. Well, you know, the the pathological people in her books. And I said, by golly, by gee, that actually wow, happened. Um, but my dear brother, you know, the joy of of teaching them. I taught, I was at, at um, University of Pitt, and um, some of the young people's names I'm, I'm blanking on now, um, but they were there uh, going to school, and they hung around my office all the time. It'd be 8 o'clock at mm-hmm. night, mm-hmm. and I said, I got to go home, <laughs> you know. I got to really go home <laughs> to prepare for tomorrow. And I said offhandedly, sometimes I think we need a course on us. <laughs> and so I left. That was it? That's what I left. It was at night. Well, I came back the next day, and there were 20 young African-American women mm-hmm. standing outside my door. And I said, don't you have classes? You know, I said, I know I have one in about 30 minutes. And they said, yes, we do need a course, and we need a course on us. And we need to call it, uh, what do you think we should call it? And I said, off at the black woman, I suppose. Huh? Mm-hmm. They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We just send it upstairs. And that day, I literally wrote up a proposal, sent it upstairs to the powers that be, who sent it right back, said, we've never had a course called the black woman before. <laughs> what books would you have? I sent up the books, whatever. And the next quarter, Although I had my courses already assigned, we did a course called The Black Woman. Mm-hmm. It's the first course in America. And the thing about that is that the next quarter afterwards, they had courses called The Woman <laughs> and The Man there. But the point is what I'm making is that you cannot bring people on a campus, right, mm-hmm. as they were bringing blacks and Latinos, you know, in, and women into these, these classrooms where we started, you know, uh, women's studies also, too that they had to have something, Mm surcease for Mm -hmm. what was going on, you know, Mm -hmm. in the universities. And so what we did in that course was amazing. Mm -hmm. I was a young teacher, so I never veered from my, you know, from my (laughs) notes, right? right. (laughs) As I was there, and I passed out out, out the syllabus, you know, and they we went over the syllabus, and I'm feeling proudly proud as this young professor, and there I am. But they sent people from the administration sitting in the back with pads. Mm -hmm. No, I'm serious, about four people, right? We're about the third week into the classroom, and this young black woman stood up and said, I hate all black men. Well, being a young professor, there was no place on my syllabus that said, I hate all black mm-hmm. men. I went mm-hmm. back to it. I looked very fastly fast, and I said, oh, God, what did he do? Well, the, the people from the, the dean's office and provost, they were writing mm-hmm. down. What do you do? You act human. Mm-hmm. What would you do when a woman is crying, a young woman is crying in the classroom and says, I hate all... You don't go and try to figure that out intellectually mm-hmm. at that point. Mm-hmm. I came from around my desk and held her. Mm-hmm. The whole class held her, actually. Mm-hmm. And at some point, it was incest. Mm -hmm. And I had not included in that course on the black woman, right, incest, whatever. Mm -hmm. I came back and marked it in. And that weekend, I was at the library the entire weekend trying to, you know, to pose that whole, Mm -hmm. where you put it in, Mm -hmm. how you do it. And that's the great joy of teaching, Mm -hmm. my dear brother. I'm sure you know Mm -hmm. that by now. Mm -hmm. It's what you learn. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a course. Yeah, teaching is learning. You have a course that is set out. (laughs) All right, and then all of a sudden you see the loopholes, mm-hmm. you know? You see what has to be added. Mm-hmm. And that was what had to be added in that thing of, on women mm-hmm. or the black woman, this whole idea of incest that had happened, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And you had to, in, you know, to include it there. Uh, that is the joy of teaching uh, and writing also, too, because you then you write about it mm-hmm. at some point. Uh, uh, but that teaching... I was talking to Tana Hasi mm-hmm. Coates, and he's going to be teaching at NYU. And I said, man, you know, when you teach, a lot of your writing will change. Mm-hmm. I said, the joy of teaching is that it teaches <laughs> the student, but it teaches you. Yeah, and right. I said, it makes you more human, too. Mm-hmm. And it makes you all, all makes your work say, okay, 
you might have thought that, but you better open up because there you are in a place that is an amazing place of people who come in, you know, to learn. And at some point, you've got to construct, mm -hmm. you know, things that where they will learn. And also where you will, you know, I didn't allow anyone to, to, to scream on anyone in my class. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, if you had something bad to say, I said, you, you need to go out with mm -hmm. that or you need to leave my class. We don't do that in this class. Mm -hmm. I mean, the humanity that we try to maintain in the classroom mm -hmm. was so important. And that gets also translated to the work, mm -hmm. you know. You cannot, um, um, someone asked, I think it was Charlie Rose asked Tony Morrison, he said, um, uh, do you vote, Miss Morrison? And she said, oh, yes. She said, I remember all those men and women who were beaten, you know, and who struggled to vote. She says, when I vote, it's like a small prayer by the road. I told you she was a poet. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, and that's what, what, what you understand. Well, when I teach, it's like a small prayer mm. by the road. Mm. I walk in, you know, and I look up and say, here you are, Sonia. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what you do. This is part of what you do. Um, this is an important part of what you do. And this is uh, not only about teaching those people you know, you know, who've written well, but it's also about teaching them also about what it means to be human because the other part, the subtext always is what does it mean to be human, mm -hmm. you know, as we explore mm -hmm. this literature, you know, mm -hmm. and the history and history, you know, of black people mm -hmm. and other people in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the other element I, I found compelling as your student was you were introducing us to not only writers here in America, but you That's introduced right. us to Antonio Machado, That's right. Nicholas Guillen, yeah. Jose Martí. And I Marti. met Nicholas Guillen, which is a joy, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think about your work mm -hmm. in, these, mm -hmm. in these various ne in these nexus. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we often talk about you um, as a black arts poet, a woman's liberation poet, mm -hmm. but I also mm -hmm. see you as an international mm -hmm. figure, someone who pulled together all of these writers in conversation, both mm -hmm. in the classroom, but also Mm -hmm. uh, in your work, and mm -hmm. there's a number of us who have followed you and mm -hmm. took that particular lead, mm -hmm. which leads me to my last question, which mm -hmm. is, how do you think about your, um, you know, you and I both know that teaching is is a noble, noble profession. Mm -hmm. It's a it it has a very huge impact on our community, our immediate community, but that resonates resonates out. And I was mm -hmm. curious about how you think about. Mm -hmm. your legacy both as a teacher, as a writer, as a political activist, um, particularly during this moment of cultural crises and right. the divisiveness we find ourselves in in the early part of the 21st century. Yeah. You really thought that it would be better, but it could not be better with the 1% mm -hmm. controlling so much wealth, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's a lot of wealth, mm -hmm. 1%, um, which means you have to begin to look up and say, what does that really mean at mm -hmm. some point? Because there are people always wanting to be a part of that 1%, <laughs> really. <laughs> but my dear brother, legacy, I, I tell people, I, you know, that I ask that question a lot, um, um, you know, here and, uh, and abroad. And I said, the legacy that I want to leave, or uh, if I leave a legacy, is that to know one thing that I loved you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved you to a point that I knew that if I said what I said, that it would mean that I would be ostracized mm -hmm. in this place called America. What's interesting, in Paris, I'm not ostracized. Mm -hmm. But in this country, you get ostracized for what you say. But the, I love you that much because I needed to jerk your head back to really see mm -hmm. the country for what it is mm -hmm. uh, and to make it better, not just to, to demean this country, but to say we're much better than this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're much better than this. Um, that people have, have struggled here in this place called America to make it a great country. Mm -hmm. And we always get so close to greatness and then we just mm -hmm. slide back down. It, you know, it's like mm -hmm. going up, you know, mm -hmm. and sliding back down as Baraka used to talk about mm -hmm. all the time. But so part of my I, I guess my legacy will be, uh, you know, when I go someplace and I see you and I see, when they ask me to name some of the younger poets, mm -hmm. I name your name and mm -hmm. a bunch of people mm -hmm. along the way. But I also uh, named Talib. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and deaf, mm -hmm. you know? And I name, uh, you know, people who also have, in a very real sense, you know, taking part of what some of the things we have done mm -hmm. when we did the singing, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, and taking it to another level. And I think that's what is important, that we go from the Harlem Renaissance, you know, if you're a black writer, to the black arts, mm -hmm. to hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to rap, because there is that continuous thread that is there. But I just want people to know that I loved them. You know, mm -hmm. I love them. That's that even when my dad yeah. said, you know, shut up, Sonia, and stop talking about the country and just write, you mm -hmm. know, and teach. You're trained to do that. And I said to him, if I do that, I can't write mm -hmm. and I can't teach, whatever. <laughs> and as a consequence of that, you know, just remember that I loved you with a passion that you will never, ever, ever understand mm -hmm. because finally... <sighs> when you really understand the world and what it really is composed of and the people who are here, you understand it. It doesn't matter if you remember any poem that I ever wrote, but just remember that I loved you to a point that I was willing to make a sacrifice and make sure that you learned mm -hmm. or that you saw the world for what it is. Mm -hmm. That's what's important to mm -hmm. me.